get into their sleeping bags and fall asleep. In the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes wakes up and looks around him and then elbows Watson and says, Watson, what do you see? And Watson, groggy-eyed, takes a moment before saying, Holmes, I see the beauty of the stars, the transcendence of time, the majesty of the universe. Holmes listens for a moment before saying, Watson, you fool, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> on Yom Kippur, on any day of the year, we must never fail to see the beauty of the universe, the possibilities, the transcendence. And I, for one, on this occasion, give thanks for yes, as the rabbi spoke about last night, the gift and choice of life. I give thanks for the blessing of America. I give thanks for the fact that none of us in this tent, not a single person in this tent, would be here today, but for the extraordinary vision and courage and fearlessness and faith and fortitude of those who preceded us to come to this country. And I assure you that they did not come first class on Lufthansa. Far from it. Had it not been for the fact that my mother's parents took in tow my mother at age six and my uncle at age nine to leave Moscow during the days of Joseph Stalin and had the courage to do so. And had they not had the courage and fortitude in 1940, when the Nazis overran France to flee successfully and cross the Pyrenees, I would not be standing here, a resident of Westchester County and a proud member of Sharet Tefila. Had my father not fought for 12 years against the Third Reich from his home in Berlin in 1933 until his last days in the war as an OSS espionage agent behind enemy lines in Austrian Yugoslavia and not had courage and yes, a bit of mazel luck, I would not be standing here. And had it not been for one courageous Muslim in Libya who saved the family of two adults and eight children, including my wife. Our three children would not be here, one with his new wife and the hope of their family to come. We all have blessings, and the blessing of America is one. None of us was parachuted on earth. None of us began life at birth. This is a continuum, and we're part of that and I give thanks for the gift of being born and raised a Jew. I give thanks for having been given long before the GPS was ever created, for being given a GEPS, a global ethical positioning system, a way to position myself in life, longitudinally and latitudinally, a way to understand that I'm about something bigger than myself, about an extraordinary journey that began thousands of years ago when Abraham said to God, Hineni, here I am. And he meant it. This endless search, transcending millennia, of the Jewish people to try and explore the goodness in life and the humanity in us all, the godliness in us all of whatever religion or background, I'm proud to be associated with that journey, an extraordinary journey it has been. But dear friends and congregants of Share Tefila, someone is trying to steal our tent. And if we're not going to be the guardians of that tent, who is? It was this summer that Newsweek magazine, I don't expect all of you to be able to see the cover, especially for those of you like me who can barely read the E on the driver's exam. But for those of you who, who cannot, let me help you. Newsweek magazine this summer cover story, a young woman with a suitcase from Belgium. The headline, Exodus, why Europe's Jews are fleeing once again. 
Newsweek magazine, with all going on in the world, with all going on in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in the South China Sea, in Western Africa, this was the story they chose. Why Europe's Jews are fleeing once again. And I ask myself, what is our responsibility? Are we to read this and be unchanged? Are we to ignore this and pretend that we didn't know? Well, we're the generation, aren't we, that said we do know and we have learned the lessons of history and never again. In recent months alone, not only has Newsweek covered this story, but short, uh, just a few blocks from the AJC office in Brussels, four people were killed. In May of this year, at the Jewish Museum in Brussels, a place I'm sure many of you have visited, why were they killed? They were killed because they were identified with a Jewish institution. Zionist, non-Zionist, reform, orthodox, secular, it didn't matter to the suspect, Mehdi Nemush. What mattered to Mehdi Nemush was the one word, Jewish as in Jewish Museum. And Mehdi Nemush realized all the fears that we at AJC and frankly the European governments have had now for months and years. First, he lived in France. He traveled across the border because there is no border in the EU today. Second, he was radicalized in French prisons. Having been sent there for petty crimes, he emerged as a jihadist. And third and most importantly, Mehdi Nemush was among the now thousands of Europeans who went to Syria and Iraq and who burnished their jihadist credentials there. And now as they return one by one, whether to France or Belgium or Spain or Italy or Britain, what's next? A career in education? A career in kosher catering? or a career in jihadism as Mehdi Namush pursued. You may have seen this summer, as a result of events in the Middle East, the unleashing of not just anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism, which would have been bad enough, but raw, unvarnished, unadulterated anti-Semitism that led people like this young Belgian Jewish girl to say, I have no future in Europe. Did you see what happened at the synagogue in Paris? When the crowd of anti-Israel protesters broke away and surrounded a synagogue and threatened the lives of the worshipers inside? And the security people were overwhelmed until reinforcements could be brought by the authorities? And by the way, does anyone know or care whether that synagogue was reformed, conservative, conservadox, modern orthodox, Chabad, Haredi, or whatever, it didn't matter one whit to the protesters who threatened the lives of the worshippers. Did you see the demonstrations in Berlin and elsewhere with people chanting, Hitler was right, reopen Auschwitz, gas them? And if you didn't hear it, it's not because it wasn't available on the web. It's all there. We know. We know. No excuses. We know. We know that more than 40% of Jews in Hungary, in Belgium, in France told the European Union in a survey, we are considering leaving. 40%. We know that some 22% of Europe's Jews told the European Union, we are afraid to identify ourselves as Jews in public today. And that's in Europe. We're not talking about the Soviet Union. We're not talking about the Third Reich. We're talking about democratic Europe, the champion of human dignity, in which every country of the EU, save Hungary, is staunchly opposed to anti-Semitism, in which people like Chancellor Angela Merkel have stood up fearlessly against anti-Semitism, and yet haven't found a way to stop the chance Hitler was right. 
reopen Auschwitz. And it's interesting, today, October 4th, is 75 years to the day that the last Poles surrendered and Poland became the first fully occupied country divided between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And thereafter, following today, the steps of the Shoah unfolded. And now, again, we face threats. Are they similar? Not exactly. Are they ominous? Yes. Do they require our attention? Absolutely. Outside of Israel, we are the strongest, most powerful, most politically connected Jewish community in the world. Each of us can make a difference. In this defining moment, each of us needs to say Hineni and mean it. And every congregation like Sharei Tefillah needs to say Hineni, here we are. And this summer we saw something else closely related. We saw an unprecedented assault on Israel's right to defend itself. I take us back to 2005, nine years ago. Ariel Sharon, Israel's Prime Minister, improbably, unexpectedly, withdrew every last soldier and settler in Gaza, unilaterally having no partner. And Israel asked for one thing in return, quiet on its border. And the international community said to Israel, because you withdrew, any violation of that border gives you the right to defend yourself. Well, that was tested not for the first time this summer. And for too many, words were just that, words. This summer, the United Nations Human Rights Council meeting in Geneva voted on a resolution that condemned Israel 18 separate times in its text and never once, never once mentioned the word Hamas. Don't take my word for it. You can look it up. That resolution mentioning Israel 18 times and never once mentioning Hamas, the perpetrator, was adopted by the UN Human Rights Council by a vote of 29 in favor, 16 abstains, abstentions, and exactly one country opposing. One country opposed the resolution which did not even mention Hamas, a resolution which called for the establishment of a new Goldstone Light Commission, and you remember that one, don't you? And where that one led, even to the point where Goldstone himself repudiated the report that carried his name, because he understood belatedly that he had been manipulated and used. And that one country, of course, was the United States. Now, there were other good countries out there, beginning with Canada and Australia. They were not on the council, which is why they didn't vote. So it would have been three. But the fact that the United States stood alone should be a powerful reminder to us, not just of Israel's lonely place in the world, but the existential importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And if there's a single person in this tent today who believes that that relationship is on automatic pilot, that there's an amendment to the Constitution that speaks about the inviolable, unshakable relationship between the United States and Israel, please go back to law school. It doesn't exist. It exists because good people and good organizations, Jews and non-Jews alike, believe it should exist and believe it serves not only Israel's national interest, but yes, no less America's national interest. We need to fight for that each and every day. And meanwhile, this summer, five Latin American countries withdrew their ambassadors from Israel. Now, in the world of diplomacy, that's a big deal. And you, friends of Israel, need to know who those five countries are. You need to internalize it. You need to keep those names in your memory bank because it shouldn't be business as usual. Brazil, Chile, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Peru were the five countries that took the unusual step, the only countries in the world to recall their ambassadors from Israel. 
And by the way, when we at AJC met with the leaders of those countries and asked them, when was the last time you recalled your ambassador from any country in the world, including Syria, including Iran, including Russia, they were silent. They were silent. Only Israel's need to defend itself in asymmetrical warfare against a terrorist group that deliberately and cynically uses children and women and the elderly to defend itself, to draw casualties, to draw victimization. Only Israel deserved to have this kind of treatment. And while Uruguay did not recall its ambassador, its president called Israel's actions this summer genocide. His word, not mine. Do I need to tell this audience when the word genocide was coined? Or by whom? Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jew in 1943, to describe what Winston Churchill had said was a crime without a name, referring to the Holocaust. We, the people of genocide, know something about genocide. What happened in Gaza this summer was anything but genocide. It was a legitimate attempt by a democratic government to defend itself against a terrorist entity whose charter, and read the charter please, openly, explicitly calls for the destruction of the State of Israel. Were mistakes made by the IDF during the operation? Undoubtedly. Did Israel exult when civilian casualties were reported from Gaza? Quite the opposite. Can you tell me another wartime situation where Israel, the target, is also continuing to provide humanitarian assistance and permit its transfer to the other side? How many of you have visited Israeli hospitals at times like this and seen Palestinian victims being treated equally, equally? And now, by the way, even the United States, which tried to curb Israel's actions, finds itself bombing ISIS in Syria and Iraq. And guess what? It's easier to give advice to others than to follow it yourself. Does anyone here seriously think that we have not, as an, as an act of, 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 of accident, hit civilians in Iraq and Syria? Impossible. Has there not been collateral damage? Have children not been killed in Iraq and Syria by American and allied planes? Of course they have, and they will, and we regret it. We don't shoot guns in the air and exult because civilians were being killed. Indeed, we're the people whose tradition teaches us at Pesach that we dip our finger in blood, in blood, because we recall with sadness that as a result of our exodus from Egypt, some Egyptians lost their lives. That's our tradition. That's not the tradition of Hamas. And when the head of the, United, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Nabi Pillai said in the midst of the summer, this is not fair. Why should Israel have the Iron Dome and not the Gazans? Imagine, it's not fair. Because Israel chose to invest in the defense of its own people. And then we heard on the front lines of diplomacy, but look at the statistics. Only, only 75 Israelis and perhaps 2,000 Gazans are we supposed to, what, pay a price because Israel sought to save its people? And because Hamas deliberately sought to put their people in harm's way? Is this now about casualty counts? Well, let me tell you, if it is, then the United States should have lost the Second World War. And so should Great Britain. Because the casualty counts on the German side were far, far, far greater, civilian and military, thankfully, than they were on our side. This is the world in which we live, in which truth is inverted too often. And now we have, as recently as yesterday, Sweden announcing its recognition of a Palestinian state, the first major country in Europe to do so. 
that a state should and must come about through negotiation mattered not a whit to Sweden. Sweden is safe. Its neighbors, of course, are fearsome, threatening uh, Denmark, Finland, and Norway. Uh, for all of us to recreate the Jewish homeland in Sweden. But it's not to be. Israel's neighbor is Syria, where 190,000 people have been killed so far, and no Latin American country withdrew its ambassador. Israel's neighbor is Hamas in, in Gaza. Israel's neighbor is Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is abetting and supporting the Syrian effort to kill its own people. And just one country removed, Israel's neighbor is Iran, which despite the dulcet tones of its new president, is pursuing the exact same nuclear aspiring ambitions of his predecessor. It's just that the mood music, the surrounding language, is a lot softer and more seductive, and some in the West are falling for it. Imagine an Iran with nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons capability, and how that will transform the world. The goal of the Jewish people in the land of Israel has always been embodied in the words of Hatikva, Liyot Amchovshi Be'ar Tzenu, to be a free people in our own land, not to be an occupier, not to be in confrontation, to be at peace, in good neighborliness. This is the goal. It has been, it's been achieved with Egypt and Jordan, and one day, Alavai, it will be achieved with enlightened Palestinian leadership that would much rather sit at tables and negotiate a final agreement than put their children in harm's way, protecting their terrorist infrastructure. And this brings me to the third and final point. In this defining moment of our era, the United States, our country, our land, our home, must, I believe, affirm global leadership. This is not a time for retreat. This is not a time to flinch or to blink. I fully understand, as a product of the Vietnam generation, as someone who witnessed the debacle in Iraq, who understands that the war in Afghanistan has gone on longer than any other war, that simply blindly committing ourselves anywhere and everywhere is not a strategy for success. But if you flip it on its head, and you take the opposite which many in America today would wish for, an America in retreat, an America that tries to hide between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, an America that simply looks to Canada and Mexico, is an America that not only is abdicating our responsibility, but is creating inadvertently a more dangerous world. I ask us, did Mr. Putin, into whose soul President Bush looked, and into whose soul Secretary of State Hillary Clinton looked, is Mr. Putin perhaps taking advantage of a situation today in which he smells and sniffs American retreat? Would Ukraine look like Ukraine if there weren't that sense of here is a moment? with China flexing its muscles in the South China Sea and frightening to death its neighbors. How much of that is a response to the sense that we're pulling back, we're pulling inward, we're cutting our defense budget, we're, we're, we're paralyzed by Iraq and Afghanistan and those experiences. And how do we look at the moment to the leaders in Tehran, the leaders in Caracas, the leaders in Pyongyang, the, the capital of North Korea? Do we look strong, do we look weak? Is this a moment for their resolve, or is this a moment for our resolve? Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt had a very telling conversation during the war, in which Roosevelt said to Churchill, I'm looking for a name for this war. And Churchill said, Mr. President, that's an easy one. You can call this war the unnecessary war. The unnecessary war. Because, said Churchill, and I'm paraphrasing, Never in human history would it have been as easy to stop or prevent the war as this one. But there was no resolve. There was no backbone. It was replaced by the wishful thinking of Neville Chamberlain, who on September 30th, four days ago, in Munich, reached that appeasement agreement and gave up the Sudetenland, 
which in turn gave up Czechoslovakia, which in turn led to the invasion of Poland, and you know the rest. And 60 million people, including two-thirds of European Jewry, paid a price for the naivete and the wishful thinking and the lala land beliefs of people who said, but at the end of the day, surely they're gentlemen. Surely they want what we want, nothing more. Who projected onto our enemies what we believe about ourselves. All they want is what we want. A better life for their children, a good job, and a meal on the table. Well, it turned out that wasn't quite right, and 60 million people paid with their lives. And we witnessed Auschwitz and Belgians and Birkenau and Buchenwald and Bobby Yard because some people couldn't quite grasp the nature of the enemy. How many more beheadings will it take? The fourth one happening today. And by the way, beheadings of Jews and others didn't begin now. This afternoon in many synagogues, the portion, the 10 martyrs of Caesarea are read. And the first of the martyrs, Simeon, was beheaded by other anti-Semites nearly 20 centuries ago. How many more beheadings? While the Metropolitan Opera refers to Leon Klinghoffer's death, murder I should say, as the death of Klinghoffer, in what is now an operatic expression of barbarianism, an attempt to look at all sides, so to speak. And will the sequel be the death of Daniel Pearl? and the death of Stephen Sotloff, who is beheaded now, I can't wait for what's next on the calendar. Have we become so fuzzy-headed that even when our enemies tell us what they think about us and what they plan and intend, we still aren't prepared to believe them? We need to believe them. And America needs to be in the leadership role. Without America, the world is diminished and more dangerous. And finally, the word that every audience wants to hear. I want to read to you a, a brief story. It comes from the Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust, which is a remarkable book compiled some 30 years ago. And here's an excerpt from one story that I think captures a moment for us all. It was a dark, cold night in the Yanovska road camp near Lvov in Ukraine. Suddenly a stentorian shout pierced the air. You are all to evacuate the barracks immediately and report to the vacant lot. Anyone remaining inside will be shot. Pandemonium broke out in the barracks. In a panic-stricken stampede, the prisoners ran in the direction of the open field. Exhausted, trying to catch their breath, they reached the field and in the middle were two huge pits. Suddenly, with their last drop of energy, the inmates realized where they were rushing on that cursed dark night in Yanovska Nazi prison camp. Once more, the cold, healthy voice roared in the night. Each of you dogs who values his miserable life and wants to cling to it must jump over one of the pits. Those who miss it will get what they deserve. Among the thousands of Jews on that field in Yanovska was the rabbi of Bluzhov, Rabbi Israel Spira. He was standing with a friend, a free thinker, a secular Jew, from a large Polish town whom the rabbi had met in the camp. Spira, all of our efforts to jump over the pits will be in vain. We only entertain the Germans and their collaborators. Let's just sit down in the pits and wait for the bullets to end our wretched existence. My friend said the rabbi, Man must obey the will of God. If it was decreed from heaven that pits be dug and we be commanded to jump, pits will be dug and jump we will. And if, God forbid, we fall into the pits, we will reach the world of truth a second later. So, my friend, we must jump. The rabbi and his friend were nearing the edge of the pits. The pits were rapidly filling with dead bodies. The rabbi glanced down at his feet, the swollen feet of a 53-year-old Jew ridden with starvation and disease. He looked at his young friend, a skeleton, and he said, as they reached the pit, he closed his eyes and commanded in a powerful whisper, we are jumping. When they opened their eyes, 
they found themselves standing on the other side of the pit. Spiro, we are here. We are here. We are alive. The friend repeated over and over again while warm tears streamed from his eyes. Spiro, for your sake, I'm alive. Indeed, there must be a God. Tell me, Rebbe, how did you do it? I was holding on to my ancestral chain, said the rabbi. I was holding on to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather of blessed memory, said the rabbi, and his eyes searched the black skies above. And tell me, my friend, how did you reach the other side of the pit? I was holding on to you, said his friend. In these defining moments, in these moments when people are trying to steal the tent, steal the tent of the Jewish people, the state of Israel, democratic values and democratic civilization, we have to hold on to each other. Orthodox and atheist, Sephardic and Ashkenazi, Israeli and diaspora, old and young, blessed to be born here or brought here fortunately, Jew by choice or Jew by birth, we must stand together and hold on to each other. And if we do, as we do at the American Jewish Committee, then we will indeed cross the pit. Thank you and Shana Tovah.